Chapter 23, The Secrets Cheryl sauntered toward the switch with her fiery red hair swishing against her shoulders and turned the fans back on. You're not going to tell me that your playing was a trick, asked Richard. No, it was no trick, answered the luthier. Throughout history, only a handful of people have ever discovered the three master secrets of playing the violin. They go far beyond desire, skill, and technique. They are the three secrets that separate the true masters from all others. When the luthier paused, Richard found himself feeling the same way that he imagined Mr. Haito must have felt while staring at the swords. His words echoed in Richard's ears. They are worth millions of dollars. Somehow I will get the money. Somehow I will pay you. The luthier continued. These three secrets are priceless. They have value beyond your wildest dreams. How much? asked Richard, knowing that if he could play like the luthier, he could take on the world. I will give them to you when you are ready. As if the luthier's words were her cue, Cheryl kissed the cat, lowered him to the ground, and disappeared behind a thick, roughly hewn door in the foundation of the stairs. Richard had not been shown what was in the center of the violin shop, and after Cheryl disappeared, the luthier seemed to ignore him completely, staring at the door with a faraway look in his eyes. When Richard finally asked what was behind the door, the luthier replied in a dreamy voice, She is the most wonderful woman in the world. As soon as the door began to open, the luthier seemed to snap out of his trance. Will you join us for lunch, Richard? If you do, I will tell you the first two secrets. Richard, as calmly as he possibly could, answered, Yes, please. Cheryl stepped out wearing a cotton blouse with light yellow stripes. Her Levi overalls had flowers embroidered on the pockets, and her tennis shoes had white socks, rising up just shy of her ankles. To Richard, she had magically transformed from a sophisticated enchantress into a fresh, bubbly country girl, just by passing through the door. It's not the room, it's the clothes, the luthier insisted after noticing Richard's reaction but that will come in its turn. The luthier took Cheryl's hand and walked toward the front of the shop. As he opened the door for her, he offered, After you, my dear. Cheryl and Richard walked out first, with the luthier following close behind. Just before the door swung shut, the cat Cheryl had been holding came running out with his long tail barely making it in time. The cat ran past, then circled around and stopped directly in their path. Oh, I'm sorry, apologized the luthier. Richard, this is Mooch the cat. Richard swung his arm down and bowed good-naturedly. Good afternoon, Mooch. It's a pleasure to meet you. The cat walked over and, as cats do, allowed Richard the privilege of petting him. It was hot outside, and Richard was surprised that they were going to walk anywhere. They proceeded around the violin shop, and upon reaching the back, Richard noticed a rock-paved road, just like the officer had described. Richard had studied the Aztec civilization in school and even done a report on ancient Mayan highways, but he couldn't remember any references to either of them existing that far north. He was hesitant to ask, knowing how the luthier felt about copies, yet he couldn't help himself. Are these steps and this road really genuine? The luthier quickly swung around with his eyes appearing more severe than those of the fanged serpents on the front of his shop. 
Recalling the Luthier's comments about copies having no soul, Richard decided that the Luthier meant any copy, and he quickly apologized before the Luthier could verbally respond. It amazed Richard how quickly the Luthier then smiled, as though nothing had been said, and he began walking again. The temple and this road were constructed at the height of the Aztec Empire. Everything else was constructed over many thousands of years. It was the joint effort of numerous cultures and was to be the greatest monument of its kind. But before it could be finished, everything had to be buried to save it from destruction. Everything? asked Richard. The Luthiers' smile grew wide, and they continued in silence. Every stone in the road fit perfectly, even though there were thousands of unique sizes and shapes. Just as Richard considered commenting about the temperature, the road swerved around a knoll and descended into a valley. The tops of green trees appeared, and a cool breeze floated up from below. Within a few more steps, the temperature lowered at least 20 degrees, and Richard looked around in wonder as the vegetation quickly changed from that of the harsh desert to the soft, lush plants of the forest. Just before they reached the valley floor, Richard noticed honeybees busily flying between a hole in the rock cliff and a field of clover. Within a few more steps, a pond surrounded by sunflowers appeared. The luthier left the road so he could pick one and bring it back for Cheryl. Mooch took the opportunity to chase a bee flying through the flowers, then lay down and rolled over on the soft, velvety grass. After finally noticing that the small group was leaving him behind, he quickly caught up, only to fall truantly behind again. When Richard had first seen Cheryl and the Luthier together, they gave him the impression that they had been married for many years. Now, as they walked together hand in hand, they seemed like teenage lovers. The thought brought back both good and bad memories, so Richard quickly pushed them from his mind. The Luthier turned to Richard. My violin shop must be in the desert to cure the wood properly and to dry the varnish. At the same time, my family and I love the cool water and the lush trees. There are also plants and ingredients that I must have that are only found here. The luthier motioned around the valley. This is the only place on earth that offers everything. As the luthier finished speaking, the valley opened up into a paradise, and Richard was speechless. There were lush meadows and majestic trees that made him feel like he had just stepped into a dream. Richard thought back to the officer's story about riding horses in the valley when he was young. How could all of this have been here and no one else know about it? The luthier pointed across the valley. Those who were building the temple sealed off all of the largest springs and fountains, then buried everything else beneath large mounds of earth. They only left a few of the smallest springs still flowing. When the road swerved again, there were recently uncovered stone paths leading out across the valley floor, most of them dead-ending into mounds of dirt. Richard then thought he could see sculptured faces on the cliffs through the leaves of the trees. He started down one of the paths for a better look, but instead of stopping and offering to answer his questions, the luthier quickened his pace. Were those Mayan? Richard asked while trying to catch back up. The luthier nodded, then continued without any further explanation. It soon became impossible for Richard to judge how wide the valley was, and he felt like he had been lost to the outside world. Finally, a house appeared in the distance and the luthier slackened his pace. It was a unique mixture of styles, Victorian and country, 
painted colonial blue with white gingerbread trim and a large wraparound porch. Beyond the house were vineyards dotting the hillsides, giving as picturesque of a setting as that from any fairy tale. The large mountains on either side were all that Richard could see of the horizon, and high on the western slope he noticed the silver mine that the police officer had spoken of. Exotic horses pranced through a pasture and put their noses over the fence as Richard walked by. There were other buildings behind the house, each seeming to serve a different purpose. It was almost too much to take in all at once, and Richard hesitated before following the Luthier and Cheryl up onto the porch. When Richard noticed the wine press in the corner, he asked, Do you make your own wine? Yes, replied the Luthier, though you may want to think of it as our special blend of grape juice. As they entered the house through a massive round-top door, Cheryl asked, Would you like to try some, Mr. Gaspar? I would be delighted. You may call me Richard, if you like. And you may call me Cheryl, she responded. Please, have a seat, Richard, while I pull out some grape juice and finish preparing lunch. Richard looked at the high ceilings, beveled windows, and luxurious furnishings, then noticed the signs of children. He remembered that the Luthier had a son named Schuyler, but he was still amazed. He knew that most of the master Luthiers of the past had had families, yet he still envisioned an old, gray-haired man working alone at his bench. No matter how hard he tried, he had a difficult time imagining anything else. How many children do you have? Three, replied the Luthier. Schuyler is 18, Tessa 16, and Coulter 11. Cheryl returned and added to the Luthier's comments. Schuyler is at basic training. Tessa and Coulter are water skiing at Lake Mead with friends. Cheryl carefully lowered a platter onto a sculptured table between Richard and the Luthier. There were three glasses and a large bottle. Allow me, offered the Luthier, while lifting the bottle and pulling the cork from its mouth. The glass was heavy and thick, with fiery curls of red and brown. It reminded Richard of an ancient Egyptian vase he had seen at the museum in Cairo. The three individual glasses were just as intriguing, each a mixture of blues and greens with tiny wisps of other colors mixed in. Richard wondered if it wasn't indeed some ancient wine being poured before him. To your success, the Luthier announced with a smile. And to yours, Richard replied. The Luthier nodded in Cheryl's direction. She's already a success. They all smiled, then drank together. The juice had a unique blend of sophisticated flavors, yet was cool and refreshing at the same time. Richard was pleased. It was very good, even though he could tell that it contained no alcohol. It's wonderful. Thank you. Richard noticed that the flavor developed and changed every time he took a sip. It was as though a rainbow of flavors had filled his mouth, reminding him of the fragrances surrounding Circe when she had hugged him. Richard lifted the glass and admired it while the Luthier caressed the textures of his own drinking cup. I love to blow glass. You blew these? Richard didn't even know why he asked the question. He already knew the answer. Right over there. Next to the garage, the Luthier replied. He pointed toward a structure that looked like it had come from ancient Sumeria. These were some of my first pieces. Instead of questioning, Richard simply wondered to himself if there had actually been glass-blowing ovens in ancient Sumeria. It's much more fun than it is work, the Luthier added, as his fingers played with the swirls of color on the sides of his glass. And I love to stomp grapes, 
Cheryl added with a smile while moving her legs in wine-press fashion. And both are wonderful, Richard replied, referring to the glass and the wine, or juice, or whatever it could be called. Richard knew a lot about wine, but still couldn't decide what the wonderful drink was. Please excuse me, gentlemen, Cheryl offered while rising to go back to the kitchen. The luthier instinctively stood first, then helped Cheryl with his hand. Richard was embarrassed because he had let his manners slip over the years. He was used to performing for the press, not socializing. Richard couldn't help but notice the look in the luthier's eyes as Cheryl disappeared around the corner and the two of them sat back down. This guy is in serious puppy love, he thought. I wonder if they're always like this. You already possess half of the first secret. You only need to complete it. The mention of the secrets quickly got Richard's undivided attention, and he was instantly on the edge of his seat. The first part of this secret is simply believing that you can. There are many people who want to be the greatest. Some may even believe in themselves enough to work very hard and go very far. Yet, deep down inside, they fall short. Something inside keeps them from truly believing that they can, especially when comparing themselves to one as great as Paganini. Something tells me that you have acquired the belief that you can succeed. You only lack the second half that will allow you to succeed. The luthier paused for a painful length of time. Yes, prodded Richard. The second half is knowing that you can. Richard thought about the words. They were simple, yet they had a ring of truth to them. He believed he could. Michelle had believed in him, and he was willing to do all that he could to succeed for the rest of his life. Yet, as long and as hard as he had practiced, when he looked at the final goal, he still wondered. How can I know that I can? asked Richard. You can only know that you can by knowing the other two secrets, the luthier replied with a smile. Cheryl and I will give you the second secret while we eat lunch. The luthier led Richard into the dining room. Richard turned the corner and was greeted by Cheryl, who offered with a motion of her arm, Please, have a seat. Richard burst out laughing. Horror then seized him when Cheryl and the luthier stared at him with offended expressions. He wondered, They can't be serious, can they? Yet they are so different from anyone I've ever met. Trying to compose himself the best he could, Richard straightened his face and solemned his expression. Then he burst out laughing again when Cheryl finally smiled at his reaction. In the fine dining room, where Richard would have expected to see an elegantly carved table and chairs, sat an old park bench, complete with peeled paint and weather-beaten wood full of slivers. Sitting at three placemats were cans of dog food and cat food with plastic forks stuck in them. There were also three large specimen cups full of yellow liquid and two small bags of even more dog food and cat food sitting in the center of the table. Cheryl and the luthier sat on one side and motioned for Richard to join them on the other. He reluctantly did, assuming that there was a purpose for it all. I assure you that the food here is not animal food and that you will not be poisoned, Cheryl explained. Then they offered a short prayer or grace. It'll need more than that before I'll eat it, Richard decided after reopening his eyes. You may want to start with some salad, offered Cheryl, while pulling some lettuce from the cat food bag and placing it in a cat dish. 
She passed the bag to the luthier, picked up a can of motor oil, and began pouring it on the lettuce. Richard did not extend his hand when the luthier offered him the cat food bag. This is a joke, right? He asked as Cheryl put the fork of lettuce with the motor oil dripping off of it into her mouth. It's nice, clean salad dressing, I assure you, answered the luthier. We went to great pains to carefully prepare each container so it would be totally clean and disinfected without disturbing its appearance. The luthier and Cheryl both put large forkfuls of salad into their mouths, then looked at each other and smiled. Mmm, it is good, Cheryl commented after swallowing. The luthier nodded in agreement. Richard hesitated while they both continued eating. If you will care to join us, we will tell you the second secret, the luthier prodded between mouthfuls. Richard had a hard time giving in, but finally grabbed the cat food bag and poured some lettuce into his dish. After Richard took his first bite, the luthier continued with a look of satisfaction. Superb, isn't it? Richard responded by looking puzzled. Please try an appetizer, Cheryl offered while holding up a can of dog food with toothpicks sticking out of it. When Richard saw the sincere look on Cheryl's face, he couldn't refuse, though he almost did after looking at the can again. Finally, he pulled out a toothpick with a square piece of something stuck on the end and stared at it. It was only after Cheryl and the luthier had both taken bites of their own appetizers that Richard decided he was really going to do it. He stared at the little dog pictured on the side of the can while lifting it to his mouth. The luthier declared, Fantastic! Just as Richard closed his eyes and bit into it. It is quite good, he realized, after finally chewing and swallowing. Let's have a drink, offered the luthier, and he picked up one of the large specimen containers. The cup had a hospital sticker on the side and a patient number written in ballpoint pen. The luthier's was darker than Richard's, with a different room number and name. The luthier smiled and waited for Richard and Cheryl to join him. To your health, the luthier offered, while he and Cheryl raised their containers high in the air. Upon seeing Richard's hesitation, the luthier prodded again. As soon as you drink, I will tell you the second secret. It is worth it. Richard thought it over more than twice before finally raising his container. Then they all drank together. The liquid was warm and Richard involuntarily spewed it out all over the table. Richard quickly wiped off his mouth while the luthier held up his glass and declared, Wonderful and inspiring. He glanced at Cheryl and shook his head while struggling not to laugh, though possibly a little too warm. Even though Richard realized that it was just apple juice, he exclaimed, Enough is enough! What are you getting at? What else are you going to make me eat? He demanded in a huff while rising from the table. Superb! Fantastic! Wonderful! Inspiring! I weep with joy at the very thought of it! The luthier yelled while standing and his fiery eyes glaring at Richard. And yet, that is what you want the critics to say. Richard tried to grasp the meaning of the luthier's words. I don't play my violin standing on a toilet, he declared. I don't make a clown of myself, and I don't set the stage, interrupted Cheryl. The second secret is set the stage, clarified the luthier. 
Did you notice how quickly your opinion of us went from that of admiration and awe to that of disgust and loathing? Stop and think before you say anything more. How long has it been since you sat in the violin shop and listened to me play the violin? Who did you think that I was? And what would you give for people to think of you that way? and even more. You must understand, Richard, this food is just as wonderful as my performance was less than an hour ago. There was a profound silence in the room while the luthier slowly sat down and waited for Richard's response. Richard relaxed back onto the bench and the luthier continued. The drink in the parlor was it good? Richard nodded while Cheryl reached under the table and lifted up a bottle of store brand grape juice. It cannot be, Richard declared. It is, replied the luthier. No virtuoso can take the leap and join Paganini as a master virtuoso without first setting the stage. <laughs>